a brain club. Let me share screen and get us oriented. And I'll introduce us to our special guest. All right, so today we'll be talking about family relationships. Uh, we're continuing our month-long conversation on the power of community, and community means so many things, and family means so many things. Um, brain Club, of course, our weekly community conversation about everyday brain life. It's our very intentionally created educational space uh, for the collective ABB community for purposes of providing education about neurodiversity and related topics of inclusion. Just naming the thing that though all brains belong does have a, a host of different medical and um, uh, support space programs. Uh, this is not one of them. Uh, this is for education purposes only. This is not for medical or mental health advice. This is not a support group. All forms of communication um, are welcome here. All forms of participation are okay here. Uh, you can have your video on or off. And even if it's on, we do not expect anything of you. We certainly do not need you to sit still or look at the camera or any other neuronormative constructs. Please feel free to walk, move, fidget, stim, eat, take breaks. Um, I was, uh, was as, as some of you were joining in the beginning, I was saying it's, it's pretty normal here at Brain Club to be like, you know, eating dinner with a cat on your head. And it's just, you know, that's, that's what goes here because uh, there's no right way to participate. All forms of communication, you know, unmute, use mouth words, type in the chat box. You're also welcome to send private or direct chat messages. And if you ask a question that way, I won't read your name out. And, um, you know, safety comes first here at Brain Club. In addition to affirming all aspects of identity, it's just really important to kind of balance individual versus collective, the group's access needs. So in particular, um, you know, you're welcome to share anything that you're comfortable sharing, but um, if it is something that was distressing, it's important that we discuss the impact of our experiences, not the events themselves. You know, for example, saying I'm a heart, I'm, ha I, I'm having a hard time or I've experienced harm as opposed to like specific events and details. Our goal, of course, is to create a space where people can collectively learn and unlearn and feel safe and in many instances experience something that's quite different from the outside world. So um, you know, we, very, we try to very intentionally facilitate uh, to be able to, to create that space right from the very first time. Um, last bit of access uh, related topics, uh, closed captioning is enabled. You just have to toggle it on if you'd like to use it. So depending on your version of Zoom, you might see the live transcript closed captioning icon, but if not, look for the more dot 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 and choose show subtitles. You can do the same and choose hide subtitles if you want to turn them on. And that's my visual support to open up the chat box. So I'll actually see it if anybody's using it. Okay, great. Um, so, uh, you know, as, as I said, it's very important for us to create this community here uh, where people feel safe and feel like you can show up as your true self. It's, um, and, you know, uh, we, we really appreciate everyone being here and we really appreciate everyone who helps to spread the word about Brain Club and our other free community programs. And in fact, if, if anyone would like to join our spread the word team of volunteers, help share our social media posts, et cetera, we would, we would be grateful. And Lizzie's put a link in the chat for anybody who wants to get involved with the spread the word team. All right. So as I said, we're continuing our month long theme of the power of community. You know, when I when when I think about family relationships and kind of what comes up in our in our medical practice and at Brain Club, like there's a lot of common factors, common challenges that neurodivergent folks, um, you know, have to navigate relating to perspective taking. Um, you know, we know the double empathy problem where uh, people with um, you know uh, different types of brains. Um, miscommunication happens when there's a mismatch of communication style and worldview. Double empathy problem is a, a term that was coined by Dr. Um, Damian Milton, who's an autistic social scientist in the UK. And the double empathy problem is that it's not like there's one normal type of social skills um, or communication skills. It's that it's that mismatch. Uh, perspective taking goes both ways. We all have grown up with with norms, um, you know, things we were taught as young kids that got like reinforced by culture. And, you know, whether you are here as a parent um, or whether you are here as, you know, an adult kind of navigating your relationship with 
parents um, or both, right? So it's like these cultural norms, sorry, I'm just, I just hit a button. Um, um, these cultural norms that, that, that change for people over time as we're exposed to different, different things. We read things, we have different conversations. We change, change the way that we think sometimes. And when that is a, a, a mismatch for the way that someone else um, is parenting culture, um, that conflict arises. You know, there's so, so much here. You know, we talk a lot at Brewing Club, we talk about access needs, what anyone needs for full and meaningful participation. And in any type of relationship, you know, whether it's your family of origin or, you know, any any relationships really, you know, we bring two people together. We all have different brains, different brains have different needs. You know, we're going to have conflicting access needs and having having a, a plan to negotiate and navigate conflicting access needs is part part of you know, keep the universe is figuring that out. Um, so today we are so excited to be joined again. Um, we've got a, a returning uh, special Brain Club guest. Um, so Anna Howes is a family coach and educator. Um, she offers support for personal transformation and whole family healing um, through her family coaching practice um, and online education space. And um, uh, well, also Lizzie, if you can pop some some chat some uh, links in the chat so that you can see Anna's website and her Instagram handle, and uh, we're we're really 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 excited to have you back with us, Anna. Let me unshare screen and we'll get a get our spotlight going. Hi, thank you so much. Ooh, it's so exciting. Whoa, there that's me. Well, oh, there God. you go. I'm gonna I join you. I'm gonna join you. We're gonna, we're gonna have a little conversation. Here we go. We're um at a spotlight. There you go. I've never I've never Yay. like spotlit myself before. That's weird. Okay. Um okay. <laughs> so anyway, um welcome. Welcome to Brain Club. Thank you. I love it here. <laughs> yeah. And I do and I have my I have my dinner here and I've got family poking in and out of the door. i probably have a question from my teenager any moment you never know and um and they know it's okay to jump in and be part of this experience and catch my attention anytime they need so amen and I think it's really important just to you know model model family culture like that so and speaking of which I would love love to hear about your journey as a parent and as a professional in like defining your family culture and maybe redefining family culture over time yeah, thank you. Even um, just having the opportunity to think about this has been a really cool journey. I have no idea what I'm going to say right now because I didn't write myself a script this time because I knew um, when I talked to Mel, I just things start to roll and I, I you know, I, I kind of get in the groove and I, I discover things about myself just by answering these kinds of questions. And um, so uh, when I was trying to think about this question, you know, and thinking about our family culture and how we kind of broke the mold over time, it wasn't like, like one day we were like in the normative, like, you know, normal world. And then all of a sudden we had like our own way of doing things. It was something that was sort of like a slow evolution over time. And I think that it's important to name a couple of really important influences in my life that gave me the courage and strength to keep working at like chipping away at some of those um, pressures that held me trying to, you know, control everybody into the little box, because that is, you know, we do set out as parents, like, and family members trying to, we want, we want to be in relationship, we want to do it right, you know, and there's a lot of pressure there. Um, and so I want to just mention my mother who, um, is no longer uh, on the planet living here with us, but is still such a huge influence in my life. Um, and she was a really radical special educator. And she was a total rebel. Um, she was kind of like the black sheep of my family, um, of the like the longer lineage where she just really always set out to blaze her own path. Um, you know, we I still... I'll talk a little bit more too about my own journey with it, you know, in a larger scope of a family. But I think that her example of just not 
um, not falling to those social pressures for her students, like knowing when she saw what a, what a child really needed to feel part of the community or to thrive, she didn't let any of the naysayers get in her way. She just plowed through and said, no, nope, we're not doing, no, nope, we're not doing that. No, nope, we're not doing that. We're doing this, you know? And she had this incredible way of building community. And my sister and I both were always a huge part of that, um, which was really a really special way to grow up. Um, and so then for me as a parent, um, you know, at first, you know, all of us have these precious little things we want to keep alive and we want them to be, you know, accepted and loved and all of those things. And yet, um, you know, the, that kind of gaze of society seems to always be on us. And I think in my early years, I, I really struggled with that pressure to want to get my kids to conform. Um, and so one of the big uh, well, it's like a big thing, but it again, it happened in like little tiny doses over time was like this awareness where, you know, every once in a while to get to this point where I would feel like this doesn't feel good. This doesn't feel good. and doesn't feel healthy. Right. I'd get into we're sitting there butting heads. We're in conflict. We have different access needs. We have different, um, you know, ideas of what's required in the day. And we're just like stuck stuck and it didn't feel good and so over time those little moments that didn't feel good were moments where I was like wait a second why are we doing this <laughs> what why, why are we doing this and what is the need underneath right and one of the things that I love that you say Mel that I have now like I just say it all the time I talk to families about this all the time is what in this moment right now what will help us feel safe and connected just asking that question. Is it getting to school on time? Mm, no, actually, it's not, right? <laughs> Why are we fighting about that? That doesn't seem like part of our family culture of what we want to cultivate. Um, and so, you know, alongside that question, what makes us feel safe and connected? We also evaluated our own um, family values. And, um, and so I, I do have a worksheet to support families in kind of uncovering what are what are your family values? And it's not a worksheet I've ever done with my family, right? But we try to create tools that will help others. Um, but we but it is something we've talked about over time. And so when I was creating this worksheet um, recently, and we hadn't discussed it as a family in probably years and years and years. So um in two separate instances, I went to two of my two kids. So my son is now 24 years old um, and he was at home doing his laundry. Just a quick visit to meet a, you know, a need. And I just crouched next to him by the washer and I said, hey, what would you say are our family values? And he didn't even skip a beat. And he just said, honesty and compassion. And then he just like went back to work. I was like, I know, right? To have raised this young man and those, that's what st stands out for him as our family values, honesty and compassion. So, um, you know, those are two things that help us, again, like break through some of those barriers um, to keep those, those things in mind. If I'm being honest with my kids, if I'm being compassionate, um, then some of those like external unspoken rules can fall, fall away more and more. Um, and then when I approached my daughter, who's now 17, she was a little more thoughtful. Um, and she really thought about this question, what are our family values? And she just started and she said, to treat children as humans. And then she was like, very satisfied with that answer. <laughs> That's amazing. That yeah. is, that is amazing. Yeah. So I can't even remember now the question you just asked me, but I think that. <laughs> no, we were, it was just, it's just the idea of your journey, right? Your journey yeah. of doing it, doing it differently. And it's interesting because, you know, um, as you described, like what it was like for you to grow up in this, like, you know, like, like the original neurodiversity affirming household, like before that, before those were terms that were used, right? It sounds like that was. That was the environment you're right. And so, you know, there's so many people, right, who 
they didn't grow up that way. Mm -hmm. And the norms that we as adults have that come from like these cultural assumptions that, that we grew up with and, and, and maybe are actively on learning now and then have, have uh, conflict, have strife with other people who aren't there. And I, I wonder, does that come up in, in your coaching practice? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I did say, I wanted to come back to this. So um, while I had like this incredible role model of this radical woman who just was like, you know, no, we're doing, we're doing what's right for humans, you know, she also lived within a world in which a lot of these pressures existed. So while we had that example, that wasn't how every moment of my life was. There were moments where she really like required us to show up and like put the mask on, you know? So we, I still lived in both worlds where um, like it was okay in some settings. And then in other settings, it was like, quick, okay, button up, button up, like go, oh, get in the box. Okay, now show up and just like pretend to be normal kind of. I don't know how else to explain it in this setting. So I did, I did live with both experiences. Um, and certainly that comes up all the time. And it definitely comes up in my coaching practice. So I just spent some time with a mother and her eight year old. Um, and they, it was a school day, but they were home. Um, and he does attend the local public school and, um, she's been really, really struggling because of all the things you just said, right? She, the, the norms that she grew up with, um, the norms she feels that he's expected to live, you know, still live inside. And, um, and so she said, the mother said to me, I know he's not sick and I know there's no real reason to be home. But then I just said, what am I do? <laughs> because it was so clear. She just said it was so clear from the moment he woke up that it was like not going to be a successful day at school. He was, there was, you know, again, that butting heads, every moment of trying to get out the door was just a struggle. And she said, what would Anna do? And she was like, you know what? I think we just need a mental health day. Like, what if I just called in from work? We didn't go to school and we just had a day where we work on feeling close and connected. Um, and they invited me over so I could spend some time with them. Um, and it's amazing what can happen when we just readjust the lens a little bit to say like, okay, what is actually important right now for us and, and what's in our ability. Right. I think that that was a, another thing that came up for her was um, sometimes we don't all have the ability to take a day off and feel like we can still, you know, pay our bills and get through things. But she said, when I, when I pan the camera out far enough, I could see like, we'll still be safe if I take one day off from work right now and this feels really worth it. Um, so there's so many little factors that come into play, I think, in those situations. Um, and I would say the biggest thing um, when I explain, so again, you know, in our family, it happened over time and it was like little things started to fade away. Like, is everyone required to sit at the table at the same time every night at dinner time? <laughs> like, is that an expectation we're going to hold in our house? Um, and the answer is no, you know, over time we realize like allowing each family member to really meet their own needs when it came to nutrition and food and where and when and how they eat it was really important to us. Um, and you know, the same way it, that this can happen, you know, my kids do know how to sit at the table and eat dinner. And so I think that's one of the ones that kind of comes up a lot of times when I, start to explain this way of stepping back and kind of looking at the bigger picture and how to set ourselves up for success and connection. Um, a lot of times family ask, ask me, but how do we get them to meet expectations? Right? This is a big question that comes up around children. How do we get them to meet expectations? <laughs> um, and so again, that's where I think that it's really important for us to look at like, what is what does that exactly mean expectations and whose expectations are they? And, um, and then yeah, bringing in the lens of like, what are our family values? If our family values are honesty, compassion, 
safety and connection, um, it gives us a good idea of what exactly what expectations really means for us. Um, I have not been following the chat, but I see. Oh, it's fine. It's totally fine. You know, there. Like, is the, there anything? The chat is like a parallel conversation, right? I so love it's like, it. Yeah. So it's 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 yeah. And I, I usually actually include that in the, I know there's a lot of, not a new folks to bring club today, you know, the chat, like sometimes it moves pretty fast. Um, so it's, uh, it's definitely like the side, the side conversation. It's not the main act. And so, you know, if it's going to fast, just like minimize it, don't look at it. It's going to be fast. Yeah. Um, but there's a, there's, there's, there's conversation right now about um, like unlearning the, the norms, the expectations of like being the, this, this whole business of sitting at the dinner table. Like, I remember, I even remember in medical school, I was taught that the correct way to be a healthy family was to have dinner together. You know, how many <laughs> days a week do you have dinner together? Um, if we all had dinner together, there'd just be chaos and like, we'd all be dysregulated because <laughs> we'd like have to hear each other chewing and it would just be like, you know, madness, right? So anyway, um, that, so it's, 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 it's like giving yourself permission to ask what is no longer serving me? Mm -hmm. um, what was I taught that I am seeing in daily life is just not serving me, not serving my family, not serving this relationship. But I think it, I think it is, I think it is really hard. And, you know, I wonder, you know, uh, you've gone through culture shift, you work with people going culture, you know, going through culture shift, like, I don't know. Do you, do you just? I'd love to hear what your experiences have been in 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 supporting in supporting people who are going through culture shift and like that that initial like reexamining assumptions that no longer serve us. Because like it, it, when you're on the journey and you're with other people who are like, oh, I'm gonna revisit that thing about X. Um, but if you're like, right, you're like on this surface of like, well, this is, I just have to do the thing because everyone told me I had to do the thing. And, you know, this is what I do. And I'm dutifully complying as an adult in this world, right? Like, like, how do you begin to re-examine cultural assumptions? Yeah, that is such a good question. And I, and I hear the children over there saying hello. So I want to say hi back to them because I can't help myself. Hi, kids. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Um, uh, so I would say, you know, again, it doesn't have to be like all or nothing. It's not like one day you're in the norms and the next day you're out, right? <laughs> it's like, choose one thing. And so one of the things that I like to do is to think about the places where it, where we, um, like, it's like a knee jerk reaction or where the, uh, that cultural assumption like comes out of our mouth before we're it's like not a conscious thing. Like before we even thinking, we just say it. Like it's often a phrase we heard over and over again. And I think a few just popped up in the chat, right? Like often our parents said something to us that's like this catchphrase of like normalcy, right? Of like, you, you know, you finish everything on your plate or whatever it is, right? It's like the thing that you just say. Um, one of the ones that I had to work for a long time, it's a really silly thing. But it's like the kid spills the milk and you say, what were you thinking? <laughs> I was probably just like, what? I guess right, right. right. As opposed to like, yes, I, I actually sat here and I made a calculated <laughs> list of pros and cons to spilling the milk. Like, really? Right. So, but, but, but that's it's like so common, nothing to right? do with thinking. Why would I say that? Yeah. So picking one phrase like that, that just doesn't feel, it, does, it doesn't feel authentic to you or to your desire of how you want to show up as a parent or as a family member. Um, it's just one of those things that's culturally been like spit out there and you just repeat it because you've heard it so many times. It's easy to repeat. You pick that phrase and then you write like the new paradigm version of that phrase that you want to practice. Right. So rewriting it. Oh, one of the parents, um, that went through my course had a great one. Um, one of the ones she heard and found herself saying to her kids all the time was, beggars can't be choosers. Oh, my mother like bringing, said that every day of my childhood. It brings tears to my eyes. Yeah. I'm yeah. like, I really, that one's really tender for me. Um, and she realized like it was important for her to hear of something new. So she started with herself first before she could even start to say it to her kids. She realized she needed 
to like give herself a new option. And the new option she came up with was, it's okay to ask for help. And so every time she felt that, oh, that's like, there's like a clenching that even happens in our body when it's like about to come out of our mouth, right? When she's like about to say it, she's like, wait, it's okay to ask for help. And that became the new phrase in her household. So starting with just one little thing, you know, and that one, that example, it's like, it's just one phrase, but it makes a big difference culturally in a household of like how you're going to approach um, a problem or a situation in which, you know, a need is going unmet. Yeah, there's a, there's, there's, there's a com as a, there's a, a thread of comments in the chat um, mm. about, about the idea of, um, hold on, I just, I, I, I always, it's, 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 it's interesting. The, uh, the internal conflicting access needs of like the, the comment in the thread to a chat thing to keep it like together, but then you're like, oh, it's skipping and jumping around. I can't read this now. Yeah. So anyway, um, uh, Hold on. Christina, where's your comment? What'd you say, Christina? Hold on. Here we go. Okay. Cultural norms can be identified when it's a fear-based reaction. Like, what yes. if they can't do this now? What will their future be? Mm. Like the, the whole mm. like preparing for the real world thing, like as though mm -hmm. we couldn't just that we shouldn't just change the real world. Like, I don't want to be in a real world where that's that real world. Cause it's not it's it's based on, you know, it's it's like what you said before around like who is who is the serving. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, and it's really true. When it's based in fear, you know, you're headed, um, you know, down a road that's really not serving anyone. Um, and that's such a good point. I and I saw something great the other day about that, like, um, you know, preparing children for a real world that, you know, right now is filled with, you know, hate and anger and fear um, by creating more hate and anger and fear in your home um, just doesn't feel like, like, you know, when I think about that, when I really take a step back and look at that and I think, will that really prepare them or will more love connection and safety actually give them more of the resilience that they'll need in order to face that world, right? <laughs> if Absolutely. and when they're ready, which is, you know, right now with a child who's about to turn 18, She's like, I'm not ready. No, I'm definitely not ready. <laughs> right. That's fine. Right. And that's not okay. Be ready. <laughs> so, so Anna, we've got a question from May. Yeah. Hi, I had a comment to add about that. Um, mm -hmm. I'm a teenager. And one of the things that I find really annoying about that comment is that I'm already a human in the real world. Like, it's yes. not like I am not interacting already. So, like, why I'm here doing the thing working on being in it every day already amen to that yes yes right thank okay. you thank you for being a real person in the real world and saying that for us because that's what, exactly what we need to hear mm -hmm. yes and the idea like what would it look like if children who then turn into teenagers who have this now understanding that like this is every day is my real world. Every day is my real life. And it, my real life is a place where people honor my and respect my access needs. What would that look like? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because what happens is right. So kids who turn into teens, who turn into adults who are now out there in the world, who are now for the first time learning that we have access needs, that we that it's it's not needy to have needs. Everyone has needs, um, and and to normalize talking about that, naming that, um, they're doing it for the first time as adults. Yes, thank you for that, Mel. Because I think this is something else um, that one of your prompts made me think about is that um, I think a lot of this work ends up um, being the work that we do as adults right? As adults, like so much of my work when I work with families is actually working with the parents and identifying what are actually, what are your needs? Could you even imagine having a space where your needs are met? 
and then being able to parent from that place. Right. And so, and so really working, working there and identifying that and, and doing some deep processing and healing on the ways in which, yeah, the, those cultural norms didn't allow us to have our needs met when we were children and that we're still acting from that place of deficit. Um, and, and the, that also as an adult who then has um, my whole rest of my extended family who, you know, always pointed and shook their finger at my rebellious mother and, you know, and, and then when she was gone, she turned to me and like, what are you, you know, what are you doing with you? Oh, your kids aren't going to school. Oh, your kids aren't uh, sitting at the table. Oh, you're just going to let them eat out of the jar of coconut oil with their, with a spoon. Yes, I am actually. Um, you know, um, that was that's just a funny example of like one time when I was like, I trust if she says she needs this right now, it's what she needs, right? That's the other thing is like learning to really trust our children to identify their needs. Um, but that's not where I was headed right now. What I was thinking more about is kind of those external pressures and being able to show up also in other people's homes, like my father's home, my in-laws homes, um, you know, aunts and uncles, extended family, or even friends where um, it's been difficult to then show up outside of my, my house where we've kind of set our own values. Um, but then to show up and, you know, share space with others and then be able to say, well, these are like that I do, I trust my children to know what their needs are. And I also have needs and here's what they are. And to be able to communicate them can be really scary and hard at times. And not everyone is ready to hear that. Um, so, you know, one of the things I wanted to talk about was that there are spaces, there are spaces in my family where I don't feel like I can fully be authentic in expressing what my access needs are. And, um, and yet I still have unconditional love for those people. And sometimes I need to not communicate with them. Um, and that is also really okay and can be a really hard um, boundary to set. But sometimes for us to be able to really fully um, step into what it looks like to have the family relationships that we longed for means that we sometimes need to, um, yeah, hold at bay some of the the, the naysayers or the um, family members who don't really see it or understand it. Um, and it's been my experience that some of the loudest um, family members are elders who may have been under or undiagnosed in their own neurodiversity and therefore went their whole life without their access needs being met. Um, and they ha they can't even see a world, right? The way you said, wouldn't it be amazing if our children just knew a world where their access needs could be met and just had that expectation walking out into the world? And yet we do have an older generation that um, many can't even, ima can't even imagine it. They can't see it and they can't even imagine it. And so therefore those social pressures that they felt, they just, it's really hard. It's really hard to um, for them to even um, to let go of those. And sometimes that's not an expectation that we can have. And so in, in some ways that um, hearing myself say that my son valued compassion, um, that is something that we've worked also as a family to offer to others who don't see our family lifestyle um, don't, don't fully accept our family lifestyle is we talk about it. And I talk about it with my kids to be able to hold compassion for others in the ways in which they may be, um, still kind of trapped in, in those older expectations and that we can just shorten our time with them, that we can still go and we can still, um, you know, find ways in which we can, you know, be outdoors sometimes is a helpful place if you don't actually go into their homes. And that is kind of sometimes another easier place to 
to be able to enjoy a little bit of time together, but then keeping it short, we try to just keep some of those times short to shorter. And when they start to feel harmful, we talk about it as a family and we say, we're going to leave now. And, and then we do the repair at home because we don't, we don't try to force others to offer that repair if they're not ready. Yes. You know, I think it's interesting because I think a lot of people struggle with setting those boundaries and struggle with opting out. So we talk a lot about opting out here, like, you know, if this is a harmful or, you know, even if that word doesn't feel like it applies to you because you're, you know, you, you're, you're, you're kind of stepping into this, this lens of understanding the impact on your nervous system. One thing when your access needs are, are not met, but you know, like it, it, it's hard to even imagine opting out when that's all you've known. And mm-hmm. you don't, you don't know, you don't know what's possible. You've never had a safe relationship. You've never had relationships where you could show up and name, you know, I have the kind of brain that wants, you know, needs to take some time to think about your question. I have the kind of brain that, you know, I really, this doesn't work for me, um, you know, or whatever that is. But I I think, I think so, so, so often, when folks folks connect with the ABB community and like it's like practice practice showing up authentically, then you can be like, oh, it's 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 not me because this is fine. Um, that thing that, that that's not fine. But it's like if you 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 have to kind of shift your own internal your own internal cultural norm about what's going to work for you or not. Yeah, thank you for saying that. Practicing is so important. And and slowly finding the places where you can, um, where you can express those access needs. So that's why Brain Club's so amazing. That's why, com- you know, building community here with All Brains Belong has been so important to me. Like I said, I mean, I, I really didn't prepare for this conversation because I like learned things about myself just by being here and talking about it. Um, and and then that helps me. I think I said that I had I had written the script for the first time I was on Brain Club. And now I realize like, that's now how I talk about my experience. I had to practice it. I had to like see it on paper, write it down, tell all of you. And now I just, now that's just how I say what I do, right? Like, and so it, it does take practice. And, um, and we don't know what we don't know. Um, it's true for us and it's true for those others in our families. And so until we can be in spaces where we, like you said, feel that safety, where we're like, oh, this is what it's like to be in a community where I can actually say, like, I can't read the chat. I'm and if I like maybe, you know, like I'm never gonna read the chat. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> My brain does not like words written down. <laughs> well, it's the it, it's 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 like the idea that that um, like learning to trust, not just your intuition, but you know, you're just inherent wisdom. Like my brain is constantly triaging um, how I spend my cognitive resources. So I'll mm. see chat and I'll be like, and I wouldn't have had language to understand that. I wouldn't have understood that, you know, like brain's getting tired, brain slowing down, brain needs less input. Um, mm-hmm. And that's why we have an interdependent team. You know, we've got like, I, 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 uh, I, I, I stopped being able to read the chat like probably 10 minutes ago. And I see like, there, you know, we've got like two different ABB staff are like responding to the chat because it's like um, a culture. We talk a lot about this, a lot about this at Brain Club about, you know, the culture of interdependence, the idea of normalizing, being connected to and relying on other people. And if you can, you know, teach young children that, like, what a world, mm-hmm. what a world, right? Mm-hmm. Because there's, there's, there's so much that's normed, you know, like the toddler, they're like, oh, you, 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 you peed by yourself, you know, like it's, 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 it's just, it's everything where it's like, okay, um, it's, we're rushing out the door to go somewhere. That's not when I'm going to like have you practice putting your socks on, putting your socks on is like a really hard task, right? So, so just, just why why are we doing that in the real world mm-hmm. you gotta put your socks on like no you don't mm-hmm. if you don't wear socks don't wear socks my favorite example of this is that my kid begins turning 18 in a month and a half does not know how to tie her shoes i mean she knows how she does she does know that she knows 
the steps. But now all her friends know it. All the family knows it. Like it just works better when someone else ties her shoes. So she doesn't, it doesn't waste her time struggling with this task that just doesn't work well for her. And so even early on when she was little, it was just like, we really got into this routine where I put her shoes on once she was buckled in the car seat because the shoes became, were like this constantly the thing that like everyone's lids are flipping because her shoes were just such a point of like frustration. So it was like, first was get in the car seat and then I'll put your shoes on and then you don't have to think about it because you're already feeling secure and relaxed to now as a teenager, she puts her shoes on, she just lifts her foot up. And like ev- any friend, family member, ed- everyone knows that just means she just needs to a quick tie the laces nice and tight and she's out the door. <laughs> awesome. Culture so, of interdependence. Yeah. You know, we, yeah. we it, and, and I agree with Kim's comment about, you know, slip on shoes and oh, yeah, yeah. Croc season, right? I mean, just, just, I mean, that, that's, that's, a, Make it easy. It's, that's such a great example of unlearning these things of like, yeah, the correct way to be a human is to tie your shoes. Like, guess what? There's a lot of ways to be a person. And um, mm-hmm. and, and I don't know. I don't know if I told you this. Um, but um, when uh, when when my child was five, I was uh, getting ready to do a training for um, uh, behavioral therapists, and I told I, I I I told them what I was about to go do, and they said, "Mama, tell them there is no right way to be a person." <laughs> Yes. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Mm, so, so we'd love, love we'd love to, you know, I, uh, we've been answering questions along the way, um, but we'd love to invite invite more questions or comments if anyone has any. Go for it. Oh, I have a I lot, have a- so I will oh, try to. Um, restrain myself. Um, okay. So I just learned that I was autistic about six months ago. Um, it came up because my daughter's uh, kindergarten teacher thought she had some sensory processing issues. And so I start, I didn't know anything about autism. So I start looking into it and I was like, that's what autism is. Oh yeah. I'm autistic. Like that's, and you know, I took like, um, anyway, so going through the process of getting diagnoses and all that as we speak, but um, we have had a real struggle in finding a school environment where my daughter can thrive. And um, the one that she's at right now, I thought was going to be quite a bit better, um, but she started coming home with these like massive meltdowns. And to me, I'm like, nah, that's a, that's kind of a deal breaker for me. Something's going on here that she can't quite manage and have tried to work with them. Um, there's not a lot of the problem that we run into is she's only six, but she's already so good at masking that the teachers don't see it. Like, they're like, she's fine. There's, I don't understand what the problem is. And I try to explain and they don't get it. And, um, anyway, so they're not, they're not really willing. And also the supports that I asked for are pretty minor. Um, so anyway, my question is, what are your thoughts on like on homeschooling or on trying, um, trying to find ways of making it through this environment where I feel like it's pretty emotionally unhealthy for her. (laughs) Yeah. So, um, that was the red flag for me as well. Um, was when my child was coming home and having massive meltdowns. I mean, just at least an hour of crying before we could even start to have a snack or talk or anything. Um, and it was just a, it was a no brainer for me that was the end of her public school um, until she decided to go. So, you know, there was, there, there were several moments throughout her experience where she was like, I kind of want to check out that place where all the other kids go, you know? And I'm like, okay. I remember the first time um, I think she was, it was fifth grade and she decided, yeah, I think I do want to go there. And we walked into the school and she was like, Oh, the lights. And she's like, Oh, the smell. She was like, no, never mind." (laughs) Right. So it was like, I and she because she had so much more language after having been in a place in a setting where she could feel regulated, she could feel safe and connected for so many years. Suddenly, she had the words to be able to communicate how overwhelming so much of the stimulus was for her, right? So it was like the first 
step in the door. She was like, no, you know, and now over time, she's been able to say, okay, I now have tools where I can handle the smell and I can handle the lights. And I do want to have some of these other experiences. I know there's teachers and classes that, you know, I want to learn. And so she's been able to kind of work through, we have other ways of like meeting some of the needs. Um, So she's right now, she's a senior in high school and she does go to the public school, um, but for only four classes. So we're still registered as homeschoolers, but we've been able to find ways to um, allow her to kind of have both of those experiences. So that's something that I do help coach people through is kind of, um, and one of the other parts of my journey was even the first year we decided to homeschool, I still thought we needed to have like a curriculum and a structure and a like daily, you know, okay, we're going to do this subject now and this subject now. And, um, and it, you know, and still like, wait, we're still not connected. We're still not feeling safe and connected. And it took us a while to kind of really unlearn a lot of that to get to the point where we could uh, move through our days and learn through life and learn how to be um, in community and learn um, to just love learning. And it's been so, it's been so amazing to watch her and to see that now she's going to be graduating high school. And it's just an incredibly intelligent, amazing, well-articulated person. So um, I'm a huge advocate for homeschooling um, in those ways and that there's still a lot of other opportunities to give your kid the experiences that people think are important, like socialization and um, which is why the first brain club I was on was there's no right way to make a friend. Right. So I have a lot of tips about how to how to create that um, space for your child to have that um, community uh, without having to be in a space where people aren't really interested in just slowing down enough to see the little those little accommodations they could make to really meet her needs throughout the day. Absolutely. I'm, I'm going to put in the, in the, I just put in the chat the recording from uh, the, there's no right way to make friends um, with like the task analysis. I remember you like, you're like, step one, think about your interests. Like, and it was really, it was like, so, it was amazing anyway. Um, so, so we've got this queue of like five questions built up. So we're going to start, we're going to start, um, uh, we're going to, we're going to pick up the, pick up the pace. Here we go. So, um, Christina would like to know, how do you start this conversation, Anna, with your clients? I don't remember what the, what, what this conversation was, but, uh, she goes on to say, uh, do you ask what their challenges are or do you listen to them or sort of argue with each other to get them to identify the issues? I find that my, si- I guess you're talking about extended family. My sister is struggling with her kiddo, but they're just lost over where to start. Yeah. Um, it definitely starts with listening. I think you're on something with that, that kind of deep listening and, and letting, um, letting people really identify where those stickiest parts of the relationship are for them. Um, and like I said, you know, being able to identify just one place, one place to shift, one, one, one expectation to examine, right? One phrase to um to rewrite, that can be a great place to start. Um, and if people are in enough of a struggle, yeah, pointing them in my direction is a great place to start as well. Uh, but sometimes people aren't even ready to look for a solution yet. They just need to keep digging a little deeper into, um, yeah, the, the, the struggle. So deep listening. See, can you pop Anna's website in the chat again, please? Yeah. How about my email? I feel like my email? website's a okay. little outdated. Yeah. People yeah. just could email me directly. Um, and then I can offer some simple resources. Sounds good. Okay. So next we have Sophia. Oh. Sophia, Sorry, we see your hand. Find the yeah. unmute button. There you go. Um, Perfect. I had a comment about the homeschooling thing. Um, I'm a teenager and I was going to eighth grade for the first time, seventh grade last year for the first time, like just to see it. And this year I was going to eighth grade um for the first time after being homeschooled my whole life with um recently diagnosed ADHD and not so recently diagnosed dyslexia and a visual impairment. Um, and about the homeschooling, it was really helpful for me because I knew like how to communicate what I needed um, because I was just taught like from a young age how to communicate with adults. But then when I went to school, like since I've had like a one on one tutor my whole life and I could just like be like, I want to hyper fix it on this topic and master it. Like I knew all the school topics and I was like, so like, like I knew the things already. So like 
I could mask by I already knew it. And I think that people didn't realize that I needed help. So we are going back to homeschooling because we have tried for ages and they just don't seem to understand. And I'm wondering why don't schools, like one in five kids are dyslexic. Why don't schools have more information on how to help kids? Because all we ask is for basic standard accommodations, like longer time on tests, like long, like, 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 like just like to have instead of packet work on a Chromebook with um, like, like a screen reader, like basic standard things. And they were supposed to make me a plan in April of last year. They have not finished giving me all my accommodations yet this year. I'm wondering why don't schools have more like preparation for this? That is such a good question. And actually, Mel, there was that um, opportunity we had with um, Winnie where we did bring together families and kids to talk about exactly this. Like, what do you need? Schools need to know. Yeah, I'm going to put that link in the chat, okay. too. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's from a, that's, yeah. That's the old brain Thank club. you for sharing your experience. And as someone who is also um, dyslexic and, you know, went through uh, elementary school and uh, middle school in the 90s, I can tell you, like, yeah, why haven't we gotten this better by now? Like, there is so much information out there. I don't know. I don't know why. Um, and it should be better. And I'm sorry that you had that experience. And I will say that, um, you know, for me as a parent now, I've had to be the one to provide those tools for my, for my child, because I don't expect the school to do that at this point. Um, and one of the ways we've found success again is to wait until she was in high school so that she could just opt into very specific classes with very specific teachers. So now she even knows. Um, so she's this semester, she's actually going to opt out of two classes because she realized um, the teachers are not going to be willing to meet her, um, her needs and her accommodations. So we're just going to, um, we're going to opt out of those classes and, um, and do them in a little bit of a different way. But she's found a couple of teachers who have actually been um, not only accommodating, but like celebrate, celebrate her brilliance. Because the thing is that there are so many um, incredible, awesome qualities that you bring to the class and that you bring to the subject. And you do have these superpowers, like being dyslexic is a superpower. You you do get to see all these minute details. So anyway, right. I mean, we have a lot and, of and, and, you know, normalizing that we all have different brains. We all have strengths. We all have things that are challenging. And if you can learn about your brain's needs, you design a life yeah, based on those needs. Um. So, so uh, we got Liz and then May. So Liz's question is, it's, it's kind of the op opposite situation. So um, uh, Liz is asking, you know, essentially, is it too late? Um, experience of pulling a kid out of school for the first time later on, middle school or later. Tell me, tell us more. No, my, so my son, we didn't homeschool till 10th grade. So it's never too late. Um. And I would just say that, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how to, how to elaborate more on that, except that you just have to try, you know, you have to try one little thing and it's also okay to try something and then realize that's not the solution and try something else. I think that was a big one we talked about, even in there's no right way to make friends. I think in that one that came up a bunch, which is like, but if we signed up for soccer, we have to stick with soccer for the whole season. It's like, no, it's okay to change your mind. Um, so even, like I said, we, you know, we thought she would go to school full time and then we decided, nope, this isn't working. So we're going to actually register with the home study and we're going to opt into just a couple of these classes. Oh, but not those two. Actually, let's try these two. And it's okay to keep adjusting and trying things. And I will say there will be sticklers out there who will say, oh no, you signed up for this. You're supposed to stick with it. And it does take a lot of strength and courage to say, uh, no, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so and, and normalizing that you can always change your mind, you can always revoke consent, like, it's the reframe of the idea of like, you know, like Liz is saying, you know, the expense, we paid for this, you got to do it like, um, or, you know, you're, a, you can't be a quitter, like, I actually can honor my access needs and change my mind at any time. So yes, thank you. May. I had a comment about the homeschooling. Um, I'm also homeschooled and um, 
I have been blind my whole life with CVI and my family never knew it. And uh, one of the constant struggles that I've had is um, I could never really learn print. Um, I was finding strategies to guess it because I can't recognize letters. Um, and one of the things that I've really so appreciated about being homeschooled is that even before we had my diagnosis, uh, my parent was help, like seeing me and thinking about like, how do we make sure that you are happy and your needs are being met and being able to adapt really quickly. And we tried like every single way to learn print. And when it didn't work and we got my diagnosis, a few weeks later, we tried Braille. And that was the first time that I got literacy in my whole entire oh. life at like 11 years old. And that that's amazing thing about homeschooling, because now for the past like two or three years, I've been learning Braille and I'm up to grade level for the first time. And that was only really able to happen because I was homeschooled. And when we we reached out to our school district, but it's been so hard to get services from them. And it's mm. been really challenging to find any support for orientation and mobility or a Braille teacher. So it's been our ability to be flexible and Google yes. things and research and reach out to blind community members to get tips from them that has been able to support my access needs and let me be the best person I possibly could be and get the most access to my world and education. So no. I think homeschooling is really great. Thank you for sharing that. And I want to just um, use something you just said, just to leave us off on this note, mm -hmm. because one of the things I hear from adults is often like kids really need consistency. And what I'm hearing Ray, is you're, you're, you're helping me reiterate something I say to people all the time. What if we could be consistently flexible? Right. Cause you just said we were flexible enough to keep looking for that path. And I'm moving my hands all squiggly, like a snake slithering through the grass, right? Like we're always searching um, and to be able to be consistently flexible um, in that, in that search for, for meeting those needs and finding access to your own education. Congratulations. Thank you. Wow. Well, I can't imagine a, a better way to wrap up this wonderful conversation. Um, thank you, Anna. Thank you for being here with us. And thank you to, to all of you for being here with us. This was wonderful. Um, and, you know, we will look forward to continuing our conversation about the, um, the power of community by discussing a, a, di a different kind of family relationship next week. We're going to be talking about work workplace family and and the idea of you know what would it we say what would it look like for a child a teenager to learn about their access needs now you become the adult who's in environments where your needs are not served and what are the consequences of that All right so yeah. um yeah. Till next time. Um, I, I can't time. wait. And I want to just say, I am going to be doing a free um, workshop on self-directed education. So um, I'll make sure All Brains Belong has information on how to register for that once I have the date set. Um, and if anyone is interested, just email me at Anna at AnnaHouse.com and I'll be sure to get you on the list. All right. Love you. Oh, my Thank you so much. Okay. Bye, everybody.